Hey everybody, Chris here from RussianToRussian.com where we help you speak and understand the Russian language and culture. And in today's video, I'm going to tell you about five basics of the Russian language. Let's go. In this video, I'm going to teach you five of the basic concepts that you need to know in order to learn the Russian language and speak it effectively. But first, if you haven't subscribed to this channel yet, do it now so you don't miss any future videos where we help you learn how to speak the Russian language and interact with Russian people by understanding the culture. The five basics that we're going to talk about today in this video are gender, number, tense, aspect, and case. And even if you think you know what all of those things mean, make sure you watch this video until the end because you might be surprised by how they apply to using the Russian language. Let's start with the easiest one first, gender. In today's world, gender is a very confusing thing. A lot of people talk about this and they say that there's more than just two genders. It isn't just male and female like people thought in the past. But when we speak about the Russian language, we're not talking about biological gender. We're not talking about organs that men have and women have that are different. We're talking about grammatical gender. And this means that some words in the language are considered masculine, feminine, or neuter. That's right, there's three genders in the Russian language. Typically, but not always, masculine nouns end with a consonant. Feminine nouns end with the letter a, and neuter nouns end with o or y. There are some exceptions and some categories of words that don't follow these rules, but in general, that's the rule and it's easy to follow. For example, the word stole, which means table. It ends with a consonant, so it's masculine. Or the word telephone or computer. Both of these words end with a consonant and they are masculine. Now you might be thinking, why does it matter if it's masculine, feminine, or neuter? Well, it will be important when we talk about another concept later in this video, and that's why you need to stay all the way until the end to see how all of the concepts connect together. The word девушка, which means girl, is feminine, and that makes sense. Just like the word женщина, which means woman. They both end with the letter a, and that makes them feminine. Another example of a feminine noun is the word книга, which means book or the words shapka and kepka, which are two different words for hat. Both of them end with the letter a, and they are feminine. Some examples of neuter words are akno, which means window, and ends with the o letter, which almost always tells us that this is a neuter word, and also the word pole, which means field. This ends with ye, and that also indicates that it's probably a neuter word. Now, as an English speaker, I understand that it's kind of difficult to get your head around the idea that arbitrary items and things around the room could be masculine or feminine. When I first learned that the word table was masculine in Russian, I put my head under the table and I said, I don't see anything. Are these dummies anatomically correct? So it's important to remember that this is just grammatical gender, it's not biological gender, and you just have to remember which words are which gender in order to use them correctly in sentences. For example, when you want to say that you have one of something, two of something, three of something, four of something, or five of something, because there are different categories of number in Russian, and that's the second basic that we need to understand about Russian before we start learning it, number. In grammar, number typically means that we're talking about things that are singular or plural. In other words, one or more than one. But in Russian, there are actually three different categories of number that we need to think about. Some people might even say that there are four categories if you count zero or the absence of something. But the other three categories talk about when you have something. The first category is for one item or something that's singular. The second category is when we have two, three, or four of an item. And then the third category is when we have five or more of an item. And we need to think in terms of these three categories when we're changing words because words might change differently depending on if there's one, two, three, four, or five or more. For example, with the neuter word akno, which means window. If we have one, then it's adno akno. But if we have two or three or four, it's dva akna or tri akna or chitri akna. However, if we have five or more, then it's piat okan, shest okan, siem okan, voisim okan. 
So there's really three different categories that we need to think about when we're conjugating or declining a word. But that's more about a different concept that we're going to talk about later in this video. For now, it's just important that you understand that there's three categories instead of just two like in English. Now, at this point of the video, you're probably thinking, Chris, this is already super complicated. I don't know if I want to learn Russian anymore. I don't know if I can do it. But hang on because you can do it. If I can do it, you can definitely do it. And I'm going to help you understand these basics before you even start learning the language. Or maybe you've already started and this is just a good review for you to think about the Russian language in a very broad, a very general way. And these five concepts are really important and core to how the language works. So the next concept is tense. And I have good news for you because this one is easier than English. Russian has three verb tenses, present, past, and future. And that makes it really easy because English has four different tenses in present, in past, and in future. And then we can further break those 12 tenses down into active voice and passive voice, and it gets really, really complicated. Plus, English has some special types of phrases and tenses like going to or used to. And English speakers don't usually think about all of these different verb tenses when they're speaking. It just kind of comes out naturally. But in Russian, you really only need to learn three, and that makes it a lot easier. An easy example to illustrate these three tenses is the verb делать, which means to do. In the present tense, I can say, я делаю, I do. In the past, I can say, я сделал, which means I did. And then in the future, I can say, я сделаю, which means I will do. Actually, when we talk about the present tense, if I said, я делаю, like in our example before, it can mean I do or I am doing. There's no differentiation here like there is in English. Of course, you can add in extra words to say that you're doing one thing right now instead of just doing something in general. Like if you said every day I do my homework, then you could say that. You could say каждый день я делаю свои домашние задания. And because we use the phrase every day or каждый день, then it's clear that this is a repeated action that happens frequently from one day to the next. In English, we would use the present simple tense to describe that kind of action. We would say, I do, because it's every day. But if we wanted to talk about something that's happening right now, we would say, I am doing my homework, using the present continuous tense. So in Russian, we could add additional words to the same phrase that means I do or I am doing, and that will tell us that we're talking about something taking place right now. For example, we could say, сейчас я делаю свои домашние задания. This means right now, I'm doing my homework. Сейчас means now. The present tense is relatively easy in this way. When we move to the past tense, it gets a little more difficult and a little more nuanced. And that's because we need to add in the fourth important concept to understand about basic Russian, which is aspect, the aspect of the verb. And there are two aspects that we really need to focus on. It's the perfective aspect and the imperfective aspect. When we talk about the past tense, we can talk about past imperfective and past perfective. These aren't different tenses necessarily, they're just different aspects of the same past tense verb. Luckily, there's a very close equivalent in the English language and that makes it easy for us to comprehend. So let's think about it that way. The past imperfective is very similar to English's past continuous. In other words, in English we might say, I was doing, I was doing my homework. And in Russian we could say, я делал, я делал свои домашние задания. This is imperfective in Russian, or this is continuous or indefinite in English, because we don't have a result. We're focused on the process, not the result. Whereas if we want to focus on the result, we'll typically use past simple in English. So we would say, I did my homework, not I was doing my homework. That's the difference between past continuous and past simple. In Russian, the difference is between the imperfective aspect of the verb and the perfective aspect of the verb. So if we said, I was doing my homework, and that was, я делал свои домашние задания, instead, now we can use the perfective form in Russian or the simple past form in English and say, I did my homework. 
Я сделал свои домашние задания. In English, we use the helping verb to be to create the continuous aspect of the verb. So we say, I was doing my homework. But with past simple, we just say, I did. In Russian, it's much easier because the imperfective form is я делал, but the perfective form is я сделал. Very often, you'll see verbs that have prefixes before them. So in this case, the prefix is z, which is the letter s before the verb делит. So there's делит, which is the imperfective infinitive form, like in English to do, but there's also a perfective infinitive form сделит, which would also be translated into English as to do. This is where it gets tricky. And perfective and imperfective are also important in the future. In our example about doing homework, I said that in the future we can say я сделаю свои домашние задания. And this means I will do my homework. Again, we just added the prefix to the verb and we actually conjugated it in the same way that we conjugated the present tense. Я делаю. In the present, it was я делаю, which is I do or I am doing. But in the future, it's я сделаю, which is I will do. Russian also has a form that's very similar to English's going to. You can say я буду делать. And this means I'm going to do. It's useful when you're first learning Russian to think about it in this way, but as you get more advanced and more comfortable with speaking Russian, you'll probably see that they're used a little differently than the English equivalents. Another thing to remember is that you can only use the going to form, ya budu, with the imperfective form of the verb. So you can't say ya budu zdelit because this would be like a double future. Instead, we have to say ya budu dielit. So when you're learning verbs in Russian, there's really two things that you have to pay attention to. First of all, you need to conjugate verbs just like any other language. So you need to learn the I, you, he, she, it, we, you, and they forms. But you also need to pay attention to the aspect of the verb. Is it perfective or imperfective? Because as we've just seen, changing a verb from imperfective to perfective can actually change it from present to future, which sounds difficult and confusing when you first hear it, but it's actually really, really convenient. Okay, the fifth and last concept that is very important to understand when you start learning Russian, and it's a very basic concept that you have to get your head around, is the concept of case, grammatical case. I'm not talking about a legal case. Hopefully you're not facing one of those. Instead, you need to learn the six grammar cases of Russian. And these six cases are the nominative case, the genitive case, the accusative case, the dative case, the instrumental case, and the last one is the prepositional case or the locative case. Sometimes people have different names for it and technically they're a little different, but for our purposes, they're going to be pretty much the same thing because they decline or change the same way in most situations. But what do all of those words mean? If you've never studied a language that has grammatical cases before, then your brain probably is just like and you're like, oh my God, I'm gonna turn this video off right now. I give up, I'm not gonna start learning Russian, too difficult. Hey, just wait a second, because so many languages have grammar cases and they're both good and bad. Let me tell you why they're bad first. <laughs> they're bad for the obvious reason. There's a lot of stuff to remember. Every single word in the language, almost, can change in six different ways when it's singular and six more ways when it's plural. So there's really 12 different declensions that you need to remember. And that can be very, very confusing. On top of that, declensions of nouns are different based on gender. So you need to learn gender, number, and then specific cases that affect combinations of gender and number. In this video, we're not going to dive too deep into cases because we have other videos that are about cases that will help you learn them, but I'm going to give you the overall description of what these cases do and why you need to use them, and most of all, why you need to learn them. So the first case, which is the nominative case, is the version of the word that you will find in the dictionary. Earlier in this video, when I was giving examples of masculine, feminine, and neuter nouns, I gave you examples of the nominative case. Because when you say, hey, what is that thing? You use the nominative case. Nominative is from Latin, meaning name. So this is what we use to say the name of something. Что это? What is that? 
at the stall. That's a table. That one is typically the easiest to learn, and that's the one you should start with. First, learn the nominative case of a lot of nouns in Russian. That will help you get a good start on building some vocabulary. And don't forget that you need to learn the singular version of the noun and the plural version of the noun. And it will also help you to understand if this noun is masculine, feminine, or neuter when you learn it for the first time. Now let's go to the second case, which is the genitive case. The genitive case is basically like saying in English, of something. So if I wanted to say the color of the table, then I could say tset stala, the color of the table. This demonstrates why cases are really cool and really good to have in your language because they allow you to just change the word, add one letter or sound to a word, and communicate a lot of information together with this word. In English, we have to add a lot of extra words, and that takes up more space when we're writing and more sounds when we're speaking. Another thing that a lot of people forget about when they start learning cases in Russian is that even pronouns, words like I, you, he, she, it, also change according to different cases. So the word ya is the nominative case, the word I, but the word minya is the genitive case, like me in English. The next case is the accusative case, and this is almost exactly like the direct object in English. So if I say, I see you, the word I is the subject of the sentence. It's the nominative case. And the word you is receiving the action. It's the direct object in English. It's the accusative case in Russian. So in English, I say, I see you. And in Russian, I say, ya vizhu tibia. And then if I wanted to say, you see me, I would say, ty vidish minya. It's important that we change the pronouns to the correct case because that's going to tell us who the subject is and who the object is in the sentence. If we get them wrong, then it's going to be confusing how the action went from one person to the other. And that's not what you want when you're trying to communicate something to someone. Because the word order in the sentence isn't as important in Russian as it is in English. You could say, ya vizhu tibia, I see you, the same as English, but you could also say, tibia vizhu ya. And this would be you see I in English. But in Russian, it completely makes sense because ya yeah is still the subject. It's still the nominative case. And tibia is still the object. It's the accusative case. The fourth grammatical case that we need to talk about is the dative case. And this is very close to the indirect object in English. So we might say in English, I gave the ball to the dog. The action goes from I to ball to dog. So the ball is the direct object and the dog is the indirect object. In English, we have to put the words in a special position in the sentence in order for that to be clear. But in Russian, you can just change the endings of the words to show that one is the direct object and one is the indirect object. The fifth case, which is called the instrumental case, is used in a similar way to phrases in English that have the word with. So if I wanted to say, come with me, I can say, Idi sam noi. And this means with me. Sa noi. Noi is how the word ya changes into the instrumental case. So again, in the nominative case, it was ya, which in English would be the subject of the sentence. But in the instrumental case, it changed to noi. In English, we might say with me. If I just left it there, it would be pretty easy to understand, but there is another really important use of the instrumental case that we need to talk about right now. We use the instrumental case to describe a method by which we do something. For example, the word ruchka, which means pen. It's feminine, it ends with a, and in the nominative case, we would say ruchka. But if we wanted to change it to the instrumental case, it would be ruchki. So you might say in English, I write with a pen, and in Russian you would say, ya pishu ruchki. You don't need to add an extra word like you do in English. You just change the ending of the word. Now, that example was relatively easy to understand because again, in English we use the word with. But other situations are not so easy because the instrumental case can also replace phrases in English that use the word as. For example, I work as a teacher. Ya rabotayu prepodavatelem. So the nominative case noun for teacher is prepodavatel, but it changes in the instrumental case to be prepodavatelem. And this shows the method by which I work, or 
how I work. Я работаю, I work, преподавателем, as a teacher. The sixth and final case that we're going to talk about is the prepositional or locative case. We use it to say that something is in or on something. This is the main use that we're going to talk about today. So let's go back to our example about the table, stole. In the nominative case, it's stole, masculine. But in the prepositional case, it's stalier. And we need to use a location word like na, on, na stalier, on the table. So my friend can say, Chris, gde ruchka? Where's the pen? Ana na stalier, it's on the table. Or I can just say, na stalier, on the table. I'm not going to go more in depth on these cases right now because each of them deserves their own video and a lot of practice. But I hope this video has helped you understand these five basic concepts of Russian. This should be a good overview if you're just getting started learning Russian so that you kind of understand how to organize your thought process and the different things that you need to learn and how they're connected. This is also a good review if you've already been studying Russian for a while and maybe you've gotten deep into cases or tense or aspect or something like that and you need to back up for a second and take a big picture view of how those things are connected. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to press like, press subscribe so you get more videos like this and hey maybe you'll even join us the next time we go live on this channel. Write a comment down below and let me know which part of this video was most useful and which other video topics you would like to see on this channel. I will see you in the next video. Пока!